Coach Brad here. I just wanted to take a quick moment to let you know about the Chasing Poker Greatness VIP newsletter. Hopping onto the VIP newsletter is the absolute best thing you can do to ensure this plucky little podcast keeps going indefinitely into the future. When you sign up, you'll get exclusive behind the scenes Chasing Poker Greatness content, access to the private Chasing Poker Greatness Slack community, notifications for product launches, entries into monthly free coaching giveaways, and much, much more. So if you're wondering what the absolute best thing you can do to support your favorite poker podcast, head to ChasingPokerGreatness.com slash VIP and access the newsletter today. One more time, that's ChasingPokerGreatness.com slash VIP. And now, back to the show. legendary champions next generation stars and tireless ambassadors of the game sharing their wisdom and guiding your journey to high achievement on the green felt this is chasing poker greatness with your host brad wilson Welcome, 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 my friend. As always, this is your host, Coach Brad Wilson, the founder of ChasingPokerGreatness.com. And today, my guest is a cash game crusher and the founder of MyPokerCoaching.com, Tadas Pechkaidis. Tadas is a man after my own heart. He started creating regular content for My Poker Coaching simply because it was a thing he genuinely enjoyed doing. As we joke about in our conversation, the act of creating Great poker content is not for the faint of heart. It is a true labor of love. And there are very few people who love creating valuable poker content than Tadas. In today's episode, you'll learn why Tadas believes he performed poorly in school, yet excelled playing cards. What he believes you should tell your opponents when they ask you for your opinion on how they played a hand. Why nosebleed players sometime make horrible poker coaches and much, much more. So without any further ado, I bring to you Cash Game Crusher and one of the most tireless and prolific poker coaches in the world, Tadas Betchgaidas. Tadas, good morning, sir. How you doing? Hey, not not exactly morning here, but very nice to chat with you, man. <laughs> That's how it goes, you know, when you're halfway across the world. My morning is your evening, but right. uh, it, it's good having you on the show. And I just want to ask you first, you know, tell me the story of how, how you got involved playing cards. Well, playing cards is a very wide topic. I got involved with that probably in kindergarten <laughs> well as far as i remember i've been playing cards through school like basically everywhere. what'd you play what'd you play in kindergarten well i don't remember the kindergarten <laughs> obviously uh, but in school we play this i don't know how it's called in english it's free card game where you basically get cards and you can bluff or you can just call <laughs> it doesn't make any sense <laughs> but but we used to play a lot and Actually, I took it pretty seriously in, in the high school and was making a decent money at that time, like basically supporting myself, of course, was not telling my parents that I'm making that money. That would not be very, very well received, I guess. How come? But, yeah, I don't know. Like it's still received as gambling, you know, and if you spend uh, more time playing cards than in your classes, I guess your parents are not too happy about that. Uh, how, how do they know? How do they not know that you're you're spending more time playing cards than in your class? Yeah, they actually did know that, like in the late classes, because uh, yeah, I was skipping few lessons here and there. Uh, definitely was never a very decent student. Um, Me neither. Quote unquote, if we can't say that, but I definitely have no regrets in this. So yeah, I was just playing a lot in early days. It was nothing too serious, like compared to what it. It is when I started doing more seriously. But yeah, I get involved with cards very early. And if you go to poker, then it probably started in my dorm years when I joined university. I was just somehow, I do not even remember how it's all started, but I was introduced to the game. We start playing some home games 
I saw some potential there because um, my friends were not very good at that. Let's let's call it. <laughs> yeah, they were fish. Uh, <laughs> yeah, basically, we all. I also was a huge fish, but a little bit smaller, maybe. <laughs> Basically, back then, we didn't know what we're doing. And when I think about it now, the games were extremely random, but it still doesn't take anything from the game. It was very fun. Uh, we had a lot of great time. I was able to make a bit of money and started playing online here and there, basically with free rolls, uh, then moved to some low-stake sit and goes. And I guess that was a turning point because... I saw that I'm making more money, like randomly playing uh, this game, like while having a beer, chatting with the friends. Uh, then you know, others are um, on part-time jobs on construction or really tough things that they're doing. So I figured like, wait a second, I just have to give this a try. Like, I really love this. And it probably was not because of the money at the first. I really love that competitiveness a ton. And yeah, something just drove me towards it. I, I want to circle back for a moment. You said you weren't sure. a great student, right? Yeah, I would when, not call me a great student for sure. Yeah, me, me neither. Why do you think that is? Why do you think you, you didn't excel in the classroom? Well, it's hard to answer, I guess, but for the most part, because it was not very interesting for me. I attribute, that, I attribute it to this. Like, there's some, for example, I, I was very good at math, even though I have never than basically any homework or something. I don't know. It just came naturally. Like I was getting pretty bad grades, but I probably had one of the best results in exam from all my class, which was pretty ridiculous at that time. <laughs> right. Uh, so I don't know why I was not a good student. I guess since I was getting what I want without trying too much and it never was something very interesting for me to learn like by heart something. It just doesn't make any sense. So I guess that is one of the reasons. So same, why'd you yeah. choose to go to college if you weren't a great, great high school student? What led to that decision? Oh, that wasn't, was barely a decision. Like you just do it, <laughs> I, right? It's just yeah, automatic. I just did it. I just did it. <laughs> uh, actually, I always was interested in business uh, and I always wanted to study business management because I saw myself in that field um, and I didn't get in that class first year. So actually, probably the most studying I have ever done is to prepare to retake my exams. And yeah, I spent some time on, on the books that time. And then I joined that business management class that I wanted and somehow graduated from that. <laughs> <laughs> um, while you were in school, you know, you're playing cards, you're managing, managing your schoolwork. And apparently you finished, right? You finished yeah. college, you graduated. Was there any thought of stopping the schooling to focus on poker solely? Well, actually, there was at one point, it was last year, and uh, the year when we had final exams and so on, and that I basically took half year off and we went to Vegas to play in World Series. So there definitely been thoughts about that. But since I got, like, basically, I came back next year, uh, I took the exams without much preparation, and I passed it. So the only thing that I need to do was to write the thesis on business management. So I figured, like, okay, I'm going to spend that two weeks doing this work, and I get the diploma. Yeah. So, yeah, I just finish it. But my friend who went with me on Vegas to, together, took another path, and he didn't bother. <laughs> <laughs> just didn't bother. How, how did it work out for him? Yeah, pretty good, I would say. Pretty He's good. definitely one, one of the best players in the world, even though no one knows him because he plays cash as me. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's how it goes with cash game players. I think some of the most brilliant and amazing people that I've talked to like just in private conversations and have relationships with, nobody has ever heard of them because they yeah. just play cash games and a lot of them love it. You know, they love the fact that nobody knows who they are and that they, they have anonymity in the poker world. They just sit back and, you know, crush the cash games and, you know, pay for their yeah, life. And, I, and that's, that's yeah, fulfilling say, for them. I, yeah, for sure. I know plenty of these guys as well. And they, as you just mentioned, they're pretty happy that no one knows they have the money and results and they can just do whatever they want. 
Yeah. So, yeah. I, I think it's a different, it's, it's kind of a different mindset. You know, I, I think people love tournaments and I, there's good reasons for that. You know, you, it's a relatively small investment for potential dramatic payoff, but I think that other players love tournaments for the prestige. You know, they want the prestige sure. of taking one down, the prestige of a bracelet, the prestige of a ring, a title, all these things. And at least for me, the prestige has never been very important. It's never been a high priority in my career. My, my priority has just always been, let's push myself and see how good I can possibly make myself. And I found it very fulfilling. I don't know. I think that as I get older, I do want to play a little bit more tournaments just to mess around because it's, a, it's different, right? You know, uh, cash games, when you play cash games for a living, it's, it can get a little monotonous once you play millions and millions of hands um, in like sure. the six max <laughs> oval. Uh, so you can want to mix it up. But going back to your college days and playing poker, when it came to poker, how invested was your studying? How much did you dedicate to learning the game compared to your schoolwork? Well, that's a, a question that I'm a bit ashamed of to answer. Basically, back in the days, there were no solvers, no software available, at least that we knew of. Sure. And the studying was mainly playing and then discussing the hands with someone who's also playing. Yeah, that's how, that, that's how it goes. And I think actually that's not a super inefficient way to learn and grow to be honest with you. At that point, I think it was pretty efficient because you probably took your games more seriously and put more attention into that because you knew that if you want to move up stakes, improve, you just have to to take what you can from, from the game itself. Now you can just, okay, had a bad session, you shoot up solvers, figure out all the spots and move on, th- feeling good about that, but that was not an option back these days. And I would say I was extremely lucky to know what was probably the best players in my country at that time and be able to learn from that. And that's definitely one of the biggest reasons for my success. How did you find those players? How did you get connected with them? Well, there's no one story. Like the more, the more we started playing, the more we knew each other. At some point we meet in some games and then there was wait, just wait. the point hold on a sec. When you say playing, let, let's be more specific, I guess, with okay. the, your one friend who's one of the best players in the world that nobody knows about, right? Like when you yeah. say playing, what do you mean? Like online, chatting in the, lo- in, in the game itself? Like how did those connections manifest? Like at that time, at least with that guy, we were living in the same dorm and he <laughs> is my classmate. So yeah. We, That's pretty easy. Pretty- we are pretty connected. <laughs> how how uh, in the world did both of you end up getting so involved in poker? Well, to be honest, I started playing it and he was not playing even at all. But when he saw that I was doing pretty good, he said, well, I just want to give it a try. We had, we had a chat about it. I even remember him asking, do you think it's actually possible to do something reasonable with that long term? That's amazing. And I said, I said, yes. And then just he took it full force, like. He, he blew past us, I don't know, in the year, even though he was playing like just the first year and we like second or third year, like he, he just had insane results. Why do you think that was? Why do you think he had so much success, a natural ability? I do think actually there is some part of natural ability and how, how well you're able to adjust. But one of the big reasons is that actually he devoted himself to poker. He basically locked up in his room and spent a couple of years not doing anything else. <laughs> yeah, like, he, he took it real serious. <laughs> yeah, it's even hard to describe. But while it was looking pretty fun for us back then and we kind of make fun of him, now he's one of the best players. Hard to make fun of him now. It's pretty hard, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> in a poker sense, anyway. I'm sure there's other areas you can make fun of him in, but not <laughs> poker. So you graduate, you get your degree. What happened next? What was the next step that you took? And by the way, how long ago was this? What kind of timeline are we looking at? It's, I guess, eight years ago. Okay. Yeah, it's eight, nine years ago. Well, it doesn't change anything. I was playing during that time and I kept playing. During my university years, we also had a company open with my friend. But since I 
spend like, I don't know, max hour per day on that project it pretty quickly go bankrupt oh. so so yeah i was just concentrating on poker i was doing investment in one sort or another all that all the time but yeah poker was the main thing the years and as you are more immersed in the world of poker and playing professionally when did you start taking on students when did the coaching begin actually that kind of developed pretty naturally I always had a coach one sort or another throughout whole career. As I said, when I was lucky enough to to meet those guys who were playing seriously, we go went together to Vegas and so on. So obviously we learn from each other a lot, but I would say these players, almost everyone was better than me. So I was the luckiest guy there because I had opportunity to absorb the knowledge. And I quickly learned that like by chatting for an hour with someone who actually knows stuff, you can learn more than a month grinding yourself and doing nonsense. So yeah, then I hired one coach, then another one, and the wheel just starts turning. And after some time, well, I was living out of poker and friends see that I'm doing pretty decent for myself and ask to teach them. I said, okay, uh, I really like that. Uh, they quickly turn out to be winning some money, like, they not became crushers for sure, but they do had decent results. So they recommended me to their friends. And then I thought, wait a second, that's taking too much time. I have to start charging for this. Mm-hmm. I did. To my surprise, they still want to continue. So yeah, that went for a while, like half a year or something. And then I posted a thread on 2 plus 2 that I am uh, giving these services. I posted my results, some references. And this just exploded. <laughs> That's awesome. And Who is your first coach? I even would not remember his name. <laughs> uh, well, I, you say you get coaching and all the things you do. You know, I, I want to ask you about the value of coaching, just in general, for the audience, for the listener that's wondering or con- maybe considering getting a coach themselves. Like, what's the value of having a coach in all of your different endeavors? Like it's hard to put a number or or in easy words, but the value is infinite. Like there's things that no matter how much you work, you almost are guaranteed not to see yourself. So even a simple thing as sending your friend a video of your session, like a recording of your screen, can definitely help your game more than you probably can imagine. Because another guy just sees without... Um, without thinking in advance, uh, or I don't know how to say, like without having any bias. Yeah, 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 yeah. That was the word I'm looking for, without any bias. And he sees how you play differently. And with coaches even more, because he knows the game much better than an average guy. You're going to send that video and he's going to pinpoint your mistakes very quickly. And paying for the session, like, one or two sessions is going to be the best investment you can ever make in my book if you are just starting out because you're going to skyrocket your results. You're going to save a lot of time on the process. And like, there's no question if you're going to increase your win rate. This question is how much you're going to increase, which obviously depends if you're ready to do the job or not, or just barely listen to what anyone is saying. Then obviously there's not so much value. But but yeah, if you're ready to put the work, work, you need someone to show you what to do because that's going to save you a lot of time. Yeah, and it, like you said, it's not a magic bullet, right? You still, the student still has to put in the work. The coach can't make the student do the work that's required to improve. That's on, sure. that's on the human. And I've had you know different types of students. I've had students that really didn't want to invest themselves or looked at me as a coach as solving all of their problems. But that's just not how it works, right? It, they yeah. give you a path that they know is proven that leads to results. And it's on you to go through the path and learn and push yourself and grow and you know watch the coaching sessions back over and over to get max value from what's going on. But you're absolutely right. Uh, with my students, what I find that that is pretty funny and makes a lot of sense is that I have them record you know, screen record their session and then we'll talk through it, right? We'll, I'll ask them their thought process on their decision making. And sometimes I ask them to timestamp spots where they have trouble, but we still go through the whole video. And what I find is most funny is the spots that are the highest value are never timestamped because they don't even know that there's a problem. 
They don't even yeah. see the issue. So they don't market and timestamp it because they just have no awareness, right? And that to me is like the number one value of a coach. They give awareness to these areas that you you don't even see yourself. You just gloss over. Um, so that's hundred yeah. percent true. Like I don't know if I could put it in better words. Like people who where they think they are making mistakes, like eighty percent of the time, that are not the crucial mistakes because they want to cover big pods, huge bluff, river check raises, and stuff that is basically irrelevant. Right, and, it happens once in a lifetime. Yeah, and stuff like sea betting on different boards is not interesting because they kind of just sea bet. <laughs> right. And, and actually stuff that do happens every second hand is going to have much more influence on your winner than anything else. Of course, because it's just happens with a much higher frequency. Anything that happens 50 or a hundred times a session, that those are the, the areas that you should be focused on improving, um, the fundament, fundamental aspects and maximizing your win rate. But yeah, um, and that's the golden advice. I really hope your listeners take this seriously because this thing alone can turn everything. Because often people do it backwards and I have, I don't know, I worked with hundreds of guys and most of them have the same things. Yeah. I think it's human nature, right? It's like, they'll send me a hand history and it's like, what do I do on the river here? And it's like, well, <laughs> you never get to the river here. <laughs> like, why, why are you on the river? We've made four mistakes leading up to this pot. Like, this is not the most important question, right? The most important question is why on earth are you at the river at this decision point? But I, it's when people come to you for coaching, do you find that it's oftentimes during an upswing or a downswing? I don't know if I had ever had anyone coming for me on an upswing. Same. Same. Yeah, maybe it happened, but <laughs> not to my knowledge. Yeah, it's people tend to finally reach out whenever they they're just overwhelmed and they feel like they're struggling yeah. and they can't they can't do anything anymore. They just hit a wall that they can't get past. And that's when they find, you know, reach out for poker coaching. But I, I think actually when you're on an upswing is probably the best time to get poker coaching because you can afford it. You're able to listen to feedback. You're receptive. You're confident in your game. You're going to execute in areas that are discussed, but like you said, I don't, I'm not sure I've ever had a student come to me for coaching when they're just in a, on a massive heater and crushing it. Yeah, just because it's a new go game. Like if you're crushing it, you're just giving all, everything to yourself. Like you think you're great. You think you're killing everyone. And you definitely do not ever think there's like variance involved in that part. You only see variance when you're on the downswing. Right. So yeah, wh while I would not say that there is one definite answer when you should get coaching, but the fact that people do get coaching only when they're on downswing, I think is, is a fact. And it probably even hurts them a little bit because then they just, just as you said, they want that you would solve their problems quickly that they start winning. And mostly it's not how it works. <laughs> no, it, it takes time. And, and even, you know, a student can attribute snapping out of their downswing to a coach when it's just naturally variance, right? As human beings, we tend to look at variance as like the enemy and all bad and causing all of our downswings, but rarely yeah. do we praise variance in our upswings, um, which Never if you're a winning that. player is, <laughs> is more likely, right? So you start coaching your friends and then your friends start referring their friends and you post your thread on two plus two. So when did you start taking poker coaching more seriously and realize that you wanted to invest more of your energy into coaching rather than playing? Well, I always limited the amount of students I took uh, not, not to hurt my game because I actually always played more than I coach till the recent years. And while I really loved working with these students, I was making definitely less money coaching than playing. So obviously I still wanted to play a lot, but yeah, this disconnection when you sit at home and grind through days, somehow you definitely make you want to chat with other players. And I think that coaching helped me a lot as well improve as a player while I was maybe not learning directly from the students, but they are giving great questions and I need to figure out how to answer that. And not only 
know the strategy for it, but how to explain it well, even to the point that I myself would understand it. <laughs> right. It solidifies some concepts that may be more abstract in our brains. When we need to communicate them, we have to make them solid so that our student can understand. And then it just becomes, it reinforces it to us as coaches, basically. Yeah. And it's that completely different skill. Like you could be an elite player and you can suck at coaching. And you can even be pretty poor player and very good coach. So uh, I do think it's important to distinguish because people have the feeling that coaches are the players who do not beat games anymore, which is ridiculous. Like I know insane great players who are crushing the games and they're coaching are probably not for the price average player can afford, but they're definitely doing this not because they don't have money. And I would say that for myself as well, like, I was always playing while I was coaching and I always was making more money while playing than coaching, but I just love the process and I would keep doing that. People tend to just look at it as monetary gain, right? They judge the hourly of coaching versus the monetary gain that they could be making playing poker. And they just, from the outside perspective, make a judgment call that this player must not be beating the game anymore because now they're a coach. <laughs> When the reality is, you know, if you're an online poker player, it can be an isolating journey. You, you're by yourself most of the time. You're, you're taking money from the players that you're playing against. I mean, this is the goal, right? To take as much money as you possibly can from them. It's not always a super fulfilling journey. And it can be very lonely and very isolating. So having a student is more fulfilling the hourly might be lower, so you're making less money per hour. However, it gives you more energy. It, make, it gives you fulfillment. It gives you happiness to see them succeed. And there's so much value in that that it's really hard to overstate. Yeah, the last point especially. like I really love to see the students who actually were succeeding at a pretty good rate. And that definitely motivated me as well. Like I would not say that money was a prime motivation for me for playing as well because as i mentioned i really love that competition i just love to beat others <laughs> as, <laughs> as ridiculous as it sounds but that is the thing so i do think the the chat with the students and all these sessions definitely helped me uh increase that edge even more so i just loved it yeah i mean the competition like money as a goal is not a great goal it's a toxic goal that isn't going to take you very far and this is like, and it doesn't motivate no one. Even even though if you think that's going to motivate you, it won't. I'm pretty sure. Uh, yeah, it's definitely not going to motivate you long term. Yeah, you know, if you think even players that are winning players that that say like, okay, I'm going to lock myself in my room and play 12 hours a day so that I can make X amount of money, they always burn out. They yeah, one of always the worst decisions burn out. you can make. <laughs> yeah, it's not you know when you're driven only by money. You just burn out. It's not not a sustainable thing. What what I've always loved about poker is just the complexity of it. I've loved the puzzle aspect of figuring it out and thinking about my fellow man and how they approach cards and how they right. construct their strategies and then try to exploit the living bejesus out of them <laughs> and make <laughs> make the most money. Right, like like you said, it's a Sounds competition. Sounds like a plan I had as well. <laughs> right, like that. That's what's fun to me. That's that's what makes the game fun to me personally, as a poker player. I think many see this uh, like that. Um, most of players in my, in my circle are definitely not chasing after the money. Obviously, they love to make a ton of money, but it's never been a goal because if that is your goal, you probably will not make it because you will just burn out. So let's segue from there to the word greatness. The name of this podcast is Chasing Poker Greatness. And greatness is an abstract word that can mean many different things to many different people. So when you think of greatness, what does it mean to you? Well, I definitely want to leave something behind me and not just be a poker player who made a lot of money. <laughs> Why? And Why does that matter to you? I don't know. That's something uh, comes from the inside, I guess. It's something that motivates me to do because uh, just... As we discussed, if the goal would be to make money, like, I don't know if I want to get up from the bed because I have money to eat, I have where to live and so on. So basically, there's no much point. But when I knew I'm doing something bigger and I what I want to achieve, let's say, with my site right now, 
I definitely keep up uh, working very happy, even plenty more hour than I would shoot some of the time. Uh, but yeah, I think that's motivates me a lot to leave something to others and give back to community, which may sound like a cliche, but is actually how I feel. I feel the exact same. And let me, let me throw you a scenario. So you're playing cards, you're playing a cash game in Vegas at the WSOP, you, you become friendly with one of the players. Maybe they're around your age, they're nice, seem like a cool person, and y'all take a break together to just walk around the casino or whatever, get some fresh air, and they ask you about a hand. Now, when they ask you about a hand and you give them feedback, number one, I guess, are you giving them honest feedback that you think is going to help them? And number two, how does it make you feel to discuss strategy with a competitor that you're playing against? Would never even thought about that. Obviously, always going to give honest feedback, what I think, what is best to my ability to give. Um, I love to discuss strategy with everyone, basically. So it's not even a question for me. Like, right. I would surely go for it and would definitely even more want him to challenge my view and discuss that. I think that's awesome. And that's sort of the intuitive sense that I got. I'm the same way when it came to discussing poker strategy with somebody that I'm competing against that I realized that saying the things that I'm going to say in a conversation will maybe cost me a few dollars down the line. But like, I've just always felt compelled to give them honest feedback and have a real discussion about poker. Like it's actually exciting to me. I get excited when I get the opportunity to help somebody and answer questions. And it's most likely is not going to cost you anything for sure. <laughs> yeah, right. But this is like, this is the thought that can go on in people's mind, right? I do have friends that forever would not even discuss any poker strategy with me because we were regulars in the same game and played against really? each other regularly. <laughs> that yeah. actually would not even cross my mind. They're, they're, and they're great people. Like I take nothing away from them. That's just how they, how they do business. And I'm cool with that. I accept it. But like, well, it's that I'm choice, just, of course. yeah, I'm just made differently. Like I just, it's always felt great helping people out and, and giving people well, feedback. Sure. And it's interesting because you can learn something as well. So you, if you decide not to chat about that, it's not like you are preserving yourself from losing money, but you're limiting yourself ability to grow. And that's kind of stupid thing to do. Yeah. It's asymmetrical. Right, it's like an asymmetric, yeah. asymmetrical result where if they give you feedback that helps your game, they challenge a belief you have, and you realize, oh, maybe this belief is not a hundred percent accurate. Maybe I can do better. Like you get to use that forever against all of your opponents forever. Right, right, and if, exactly. if you give them one thing, maybe it costs you a small amount of EV in a handful of pots throughout the rest of your life that's a very small price to pay to improve your game forever. Sure, that's not, not even something to discuss. But actually, I remember a pretty good story about this. Sure. Um, we were wanting to play um, cash games in another country. We, with some guys, we rent a car and just drove there. And one guy said to me, you have a tell when you're bluffing. I says, great. So tell me what it is. I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> <laughs> what, what are you talking about? <laughs> what are, we're going to play in serious. We're probably not even going to play a hand together and you're not going to tell me what it is. And he didn't tell me. Wow. So that was one of the sickest things ever happened to me in poker. <laughs> but <laughs> that's insane. Did you figure out what the bluff was? Or yeah. what the tell was? Yeah. How did you figure it out? Uh, someone else told me. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody else told you? Yeah, I, I didn't figure out it on myself, but apparently I was uh, leaning forward a little bit where, when I was wallow betting and just sitting laid back when I was bluffing, which is mm. massive tell, massive tell. But I was not aware about that. Yeah, that I, it, it's funny that they would bring it to your awareness that you have one, but then not yeah, tell you what it is. You want to tease me, I guess, because if you don't want to tell it, it doesn't make any sense to say that you know it. Well, I mean, it, it could be giving you a clue to reflect and kind of deconstruct what you're doing to maybe see. Well, maybe, but still, I don't, do not understand this kind of stuff. So <laughs> I mean, not, not, not trying to figure out. Yeah, I, I don't. That's the reason that I asked the question, right? Because I, people think about things differently than you and I. 
um, when it comes to discussing poker strategy. I, I don't personally understand it, but they do, right? right. Um, it's just part of it. So let's go back to mypokercoaching.com. When did you decide that you were going to invest t- your time, your energy into growing your brand? Actually, just like with coaching, it's happened kind of naturally because I launched that site as my bio page when I started. When I posted on two plus two, I <laughs> launched the site as well. Just yeah, like was was my facts. <laughs> need, and, need a payment processor. Yeah, like exactly like that. And it all started to, like this, and it went for a year, I guess, without anything on that uh, on that page. And then when I started having these students, I noticed that all of them basically are making the same mistakes. So I decided, okay, I'm going to write the article. I see how it goes. I wrote the first one. I really love writing, even though I'm pretty sure basically no one read it. Uh, then I write a couple more and a couple more, and the wheel just started spinning basically for like, I don't know, five years. This was a project that was costing me money, uh, and I was not making anything for it, so doing just for the passion um, luckily it's turned around a little bit and at least I'm do not need to put my own money back into the site right now, which grew to, I think the biggest poker training comparison site on the web. And I'm very, very happy to present it like this. Yeah. It, it takes time and it's a very thankless job or it can be, you, you don't get much feedback. Um, you invest a lot of time and energy into, you know, writing number one is it is a massive, massive undertaking. It when I write, when I get done, I can only do it for an hour or two hours max. And then I just feel completely drained. I'm definitely not able to play poker because I invest so much cognitive power into yeah. the writing process and the creation process. I, I think that, you know, it, I love coaching people. I love doing this podcast. I love doing all the things, but you're right. Like it's hard to make money over the long term and it doesn't happen overnight. It is a long, long journey. Way, way not overnight. (laughs) Yeah. Way not overnight. Uh, And probably most don't even reach that point, I guess at all, because you either have to be stupid or very determined to keep doing that when you know that you Maybe both, maybe both, because you basically know you are throwing money in, spending a ton, a ton of time here, and basically just doing it because you like it, and there's no money from that. And like for the first year, no one even knew that I have a site, and no one read my articles. So yeah, I kind of felt stupid from time to time. <laughs> sure, I think that's common. Like I've I've definitely felt stupid where it's like I'm investing all of this time and energy into this thing that almost nobody reads. I make no money when I could just be playing poker, um, maintaining my high hourly and making way more money. It doesn't really make sense on the surface as to why you would endeavor in, into these projects, but it gives fulfillment. It gives happiness. And the people that eventually rise to the top have passion. You know, they love doing it. Like you said, they're yeah. not, they're not setting out to, become billionaires they do it because they have the passion and the love for it sure like if you would make a goal to make i don't know whatever x amount of money per month and try to build a site you could go and kill yourself instead because <laughs> that's not going to happen yeah it's it's not going to happen unless you have some wizardly digital marketing skills and that's just like a whole nother skill set that not a sure, but you don't have. have it if you're not passionate about that either way. Again. Right. You need to have the passion and be a wizard yeah. at digital marketing <laughs> and yeah. be able to invest your time into content creation and digital marketing and playing poker <laughs> at the same time, which is like three jobs and yeah. 16 hour a day gig. All I have a couple of mills to invest in all of this and I'll source everything. Yeah, exactly. You can have a couple yeah, mil- million. It never started outsource. like a money project, right? I, I just doing it because I like. And I think um, while right now the site is pretty big, I receive a lot of traffic. I love this. I still write to this day because it's it's not for me. Like you mentioned, I'm not getting so drained after writing. I kind of like it, but especially at the beginning, I was writing mostly strategy, and I think writing was the thing that makes a turning point for me because. 
Like it's one thing to understand, it's another thing to explain, but when you need to put it to words, it's even harder. So yeah, yeah. I, I had to understand everything to the detail in order to write it. And even though these articles may look simple to someone who's advanced player, definitely goes a ton in creating that. And I think for new players, uh, written content is very, very well received. Yeah, it's tough. You know, there's this argument about the, you know, the analyticals versus the field players in poker. And people want the crushers to be able to verbalize and explain exactly why they're doing what they're doing, but it's very inefficient. And it takes a ton of time and a ton of energy. And if there's no reason to, why would you, right? Like sure. all, the, all the things that happen in your brain that filter out through your mouth or through your words, many, many, many things get lost in that filter. And when you sit there in front of a blank page to write a strategy article, it is very difficult to <laughs> not Been skip there. over something, <laughs> to not, uh, you know, to you know, just skip over a concept that you intuitively understand and that you believe the audience understands, but they don't. And then they're just like lost, right? It's Well, that's the biggest tough. gap, I guess, for most because when you understand something good, you think others also understand it. And for the most part, it's not the case. And then it can be hard for you to switch the thinking. Curse and you still, Yeah, you're still talking to the guy the way that you think he should understand that. And you don't understand that he has no clue. <laughs> Right, which is the hallmark of a good coach is meeting their students on their students' own paradigm and not coaching from the paradigm that the coach is in because the student's not there. They don't look at the game the same way. They don't think about the game the same way. So, you know, you, it's a lot like poker, right? You have to think about the game in the way that your student thinks about the game and see it through their eyes so that you can explain it in a way that makes sense that they can understand. Yeah, yeah, and that's not always easy to do. Like, I also had a coach who was like playing nosebleeds, and I paid insane money. Uh, we'll not mention his name here, but I play, paid a ton for him, and he basically said, "You have to do it here." <laughs> was, okay, okay. Why? Uh, why yeah, do I? Why? Well, you have to do it. Makes sense. Why it makes sense? Because it's common sense, and that's the chat you're getting, and then you start thinking, well. Maybe the nosebleed players are not the best coaches after all. <laughs> right. It just intuitively makes sense to them. It's like, why in the world would you do something differently? It's so yeah. obvious. Like, don't you see? What is the alternative, man? <laughs> <laughs> You've heard me talk early and often about how improving your awareness while you're playing cards so that you make better decisions in the moment and notice trouble spots that merit deeper consideration is one of the most valuable things you can do to make more money on the felt. In my conversation with the only four-time WPT main event champion ever, Darren Elias, he told me that his ability to shut out all of the distractions in the world and fully focus on making great decision after great decision is his superpower he most attributes to his success. And you cannot improve your awareness at the tables without being fully present. When you learn how to stay fully in the moment on the green felt, you can finally have a clear path to becoming the absolute best version of yourself, which leads me to Jason Sue. Jason is one of the foremost authorities on the planet when it comes to playing poker with presence. As a matter of fact, he even wrote the book on it. Here's a direct quote from Nick Howard at Poker Detox on Jason's ability to help you stay focused. Quote, Jason's work is a new paradigm in poker and performance. End quote. And these aren't just empty words. Nick has put his money where his mouth is by hiring Jason to coach up the Poker Detox crew. And as a loyal listener of Chasing Poker Greatness, you know by now that I would not be promoting anything I didn't 100% believe would improve your poker skills and your life. So if you want to master your emotions and perform at your peak with presence while doing battle in the arena, You'd be doing yourself a grave disservice if you didn't check out Jason's work at PokerWithPresence.com. One final time, that's PokerWithPresence.com. Let's move into the lightning round here, uh, which is not so lightning-y. We'll probably take about another 30 minutes or so. But <laughs> sure. um, what's the most unexpected thing that's come from your journey playing cards? The most unexpected thing. Hmm. That's a tough one. 
I guess the the change to the life it could bring, like it gave me a ton for me. First off, I traveled through the world like I definitely never thought it would be possible to do playing cards. I met a ton of new people, like I felt the different lives, like one on the road and one sitting in front of your computer for hours. And one thing that I actually didn't expect is that this game can teach you so much about life. Like which what? again, well, I think there's a lot of things, but by far the most important one to me is being able to react in situations where you can't change something and let go of something that is out of your control, which I think one of the most valuable skill for anyone, no matter what you do, and one where almost everyone struggles at time. I agree. And that, that would be my number one as well, where you make the best decision that you can possibly make in the moment and you have to let go of the results. And yeah. life doesn't always turn out the way that you want it to. You just have to play the best you can and leave it at that, right? I think there's a lot of people that hold on to this regret when they feel like they did, they should have done something differently when they absolutely should not have. They should have made the exact decision that they made with the information that they had and just accept that and feel okay with that decision versus you know crushing yourself using hindsight for a bunch of things that really were just beyond your control or that you couldn't really foresee. Sure, and this happens every day, like in all kinds of situations. Like if you ever find yourself questioning why this is happening to me, that's the wrong question. Like the, there's no situations where you should be questioning like that. You should be questioning what I can do now when this happened, what right. I can control and I can do now. And that will change your life no, in all fields. Yep. That, that's a greatness bomb. It's looking at life as you taking action versus life just happening to you and you kind of being right. the vic- victim of all the things that are happening to you. It's a completely different lens that leads to more resilience, more strength, and over the course of time, more success in whatever it is you're endeavoring to do. Yeah, I think if you take responsibility back to your hands, you can change much more than you can imagine. Than Absolutely. Just by complaining. You can't get people to pay for a poker coaching site, though. <laughs> <laughs> Even that is possible. <laughs> when you think about joy in your career, playing and coaching, What's the first memory that comes to mind? Well, I probably would get that to my first student because it was a tremendous experience. I remember to, till this day our chats, uh, not only about hands, but about the approach to the game and everything. Yeah, like that's a very pleasant memory. That's the first one that comes to my, to my mind from, from many, I guess. Yeah, I agree. Some, some of the, my favorite memories are not even just coaching students, but just interacting with students. They become our, they become our friends. You know, you develop a relationship with them and oh, that, for that sure. becomes very for close, sure. which is, you know, this is why I, I can't take on more than a handful of students at a time because I feel like I can't give everyone the energy that I want to. I want to be able and to respond true. to text messages when we're not doing sessions, right? Like I want to be able to fully invest my energy and attention into them off the tables. And if I have too many, I just can't. Yeah. I always was limiting that amount to no more than five because it's physically impossible. Like then you will be just talking without listening on just saying the same thing to everyone, even if they don't need that advice. And yeah, I just don't want that relationship because to be honest, most of my students actually turn out to be pretty good friends that we chat to this day. And I love that part. So again, the value, you know, you, you, I can see a lot about your value system is, is making an impact in people's lives. It's not making money from coaching. It's making an impact and helping people along their way, which again, hallmarks of a teacher who cares, genuinely cares about the success or failure. Yeah, I, I would like to believe I'm that kind of guy. When you think about pain in your career playing cards, What's the first memory that comes to mind? Pain. <laughs> Probably busting my first 
World Series tournament. <laughs> that was insane bluff. That in a pretty bad spot. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me the hand. Tell me the bluff. What happened? Wow. Uh, basically, a guy who was opening a ton on the table and running everyone over, and we were kind of deep. He was opening again, and someone flat. Like it's nothing special. Simple hand. I, I and I just shoved. 10 free suited from the small blind over that. He snapped me with Ace King and I lost that. You actually have a fair amount of equity with Ace, Ace King there. Yeah, of course. But that still was a stupid, stupid play, uh, basically based on emotions, which is not something you should do as a table. So, yeah, I remember this still this day. <laughs> <laughs> the old 10 3 ball. Yeah, like, when, like people have favorite hands, so that's not one from mine. <laughs> <laughs> not your favorite hand. No. <laughs> um, what does your process look like on a daily basis to improve your own poker game? And you can be as specific as possible. Well, I think improving poker game comes far before starting uh, your coaching or strategy session. Like I actually take routine pretty seriously. I wake up and go to bed at the same hour. It basically was one of the reasons why I quit playing tournaments and moved to cash games because I, I want, yeah, I want to have quote unquote more normal life, um, and I enjoy that because I can't control everything, which is not the case in tournaments. So getting a right, good, a good result is missing your bedtime, right? That's actually what you're striving to do: is go deep and miss. Your yeah, <laughs> and then sleep another day through the day and wake up crushed either way. <laughs> yeah, I those days are not super fun memories playing until 5 or 6 a.m. and well, feeling horrible. It's actually fun memories for me. When you are in your 20s, it's not a problem whatsoever. We did that. We part, parted for nights. We played a ton, and it was not a problem. But when you reach some point... Like you want to change things a little bit. Well, some someone maybe don't, but it just was to me. And yeah, I wanted to spend time with my wife. I wanted to to have, as I said, a normal life. Right. And cash game was the way to go about that. My body changed at some point in my life where I used to be able to stay awake until four or five a.m. and then I could sleep until two p.m. and then. It seemed like overnight something changed where I stay awake till 5 a.m. And then I wake up at 9 a.m. and I can't go back to sleep. And then I just felt miserable for like at least a full day. And I don't oh, know. That's funny. <laughs> I don't know what age it happened. But in my younger days, I used to just could sleep when it was daylight with no problem. As I got older, I stopped being able to do that. And that's when staying up late playing cards became not so fun anymore. Yeah, it's funny that you say that because it's exactly the same for me. Like I could play through nights without even thinking about it. It was not a problem. But as you said, I don't know when that changed. But now if I have a session like till 6 a.m., which have not happened like in years, uh, the next day basically can cross from your life and probably one day after that because I can't function normally. And, yeah. and then I realized that it's not worth it. Even if the good games are running, you s it's still not plus EV in the long run to play to play that game and then kill two of your days. Right. Because still, it's still two days of your life that you could be productive and have good memories and have value. Just outside of poker and making, you know, maximizing profit yeah. and your money, you still miss two days of your life where you feel like shit and just can't get it together. Yeah, that, that's a big, big thing too. <laughs> to, again, when you hear someone talking about that, you don't probably don't going to react in it a lot. It's just saying when someone, when I was 20, the guy who was over 30 tell me, you will see, you will not have energy. You want to sleep more. Say, so you're probably stupid. I will have energy. Right. 30 is not 90. But when you get that 30 mark, you actually see the difference. Well, it's not like I don't have energy, but I surely want to have the rest the, that I want to have instead of parting through night. Isn't that so, so typical of a 20 year old who doesn't have the experience being 30, believing that they know better than the person who has been through the exact same experience <laughs> and is telling them otherwise. It sure as hell was typical to me. Right? <laughs> I, I, it's something that I have awareness of as I go through my life. And back when I was, you know, 
really a dumb human being that thought they were much smarter than they actually were, I would ignore that wisdom and that feedback. But as I get older in life, I start taking it way more seriously. Even if my gut reaction is to disagree, I start thinking, "Hmm, maybe they're right. They just know something that I don't know yet. They have experience that I haven't had. So Sure, because I guess through life, you just build this mental note that, well, he was right five years ago. I should have listened. If you get that in one point and another in third, then you kind of start thinking at some point. (laughs) Yeah, that's growth, right? Yeah, I guess it should happen. <laughs> it, unfortunately, it doesn't happen to everyone. <laughs> I've, I've seen people that it doesn't happen to that are very resistant to growth throughout <laughs> their lives. But um, that's a different story for a different day. <laughs> Probably. Um, if we go back to the question, I just want to touch that studying part as well. So that routine stuff, I think, is one of the most important things, like going to bed, having enough sleep, eating proper food, exercising. Like I lost the... Uh, 20 kilos from the point when I was very overweight. What's kilos to pounds? What's the... I think it's 40 something pounds. Yeah, that was huge and that changed a lot. And also it gave a lot of more energy and I'm very happy I made that switch. So even without studying these things alone, improve my energy level, performance, concentration. And even if I would not learn anything, I would be a better player with this alone. Right. But then you add learning on top and you became even more excellent at that trade. So, yeah, you have to keep doing this as as for the routine for learning. I do think this is definitely something that's worth mentioning because most people are doing wrong. They exactly. Try, yeah. Like, first off, they try to consume random content. Doesn't work. You should not be wasting your time. Then they have to study everything at once, which is, again, ridiculous. Like the only thing I can imagine working is to pick a spot. Like we talked at the beginning, you need to pick spots that happen most often. So you pick sea betting, let's say, and you study that on different boards and different runouts, how you should play. And when you master one, you move to another. And that's how you should be studying. You should devote some time. If you are not able to stick with it, as most people actually, they decide to study and they never study, just block a time in your calendar every week or every second day, depending on your situation. And it definitely will make things better for you. Not even question. But yeah, you're right. It's so easy to get distracted by, you know, a turn decision that happens once every two months or a river decision that, like I said earlier, happens once in a lifetime and to devote a lot of time and energy into these infrequent spots that just never come up, that aren't going to make a high impact on your win rate. Like you said, bear down on the fundamentals, bear down on the high frequency spots and learn how to play those better than your opponents, learn them inside and out. And that's really what makes a giant impact versus getting distracted and studying stuff that's way farther, way too deep in the decision tree that number one, you're probably not ready for yet. And number two, it's just not going to give you the bang for your buck for where you're at in your, your pro- poker journey. Yeah. And I like the point you made before, because most likely you should probably not even be in this spot. So studying it is ridiculous to say the least. <laughs> exactly. What a waste of time to study a spot that you learn two months from now. You shouldn't have ever even been in in the first place, <laughs> right? Like what a waste of time, right? Yeah. Since to, to your surprise, you should not be opening it for you to come the gun. <laughs> yeah. You should not have studied shoving with a 10 and the three at the WSOP <laughs> tournament. It's not, uh, it was not a valuable study I know session. You, were, you were going to turn this on me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, if you could gift poker players one book to read, and it doesn't even have to be a book on poker specifically, what would it be? I had a memory back in this when we're starting playing. The actual books were the thing because there's not so many training materials. My high stakes crush of friend gave me a book called Let There Be a Range. So at the time, it was groundbreaking. No, what people didn't know what is a range. <laughs> so I think that is the book that could change how you see poker if you're just starting out. As far as new books, I actually do not know too much, too many of those. I have read Matthew Janda, if I get this right, Application of No Limit Hold'em, which mm-hmm. I think is definitely a good read as well because it gives you some sound math advice. 
And I just can't recommend any, any books uh, apart of that. Yeah, it's, it's interesting that I think the biggest breakthroughs in poker have come with solidifying language behind what we're learning. And even the concept of range, you know, before range was a popular term in the lexicon of poker players, players still thought in terms of range, right? They, they didn't, they just didn't solidly say this is their range. They would say, Oh, they could have this. They could have that. They could have this. This is how they play that. Um, But when you start solidifying the language, that's when a lot of the growth comes. And in my mind, whenever you're improving the language of poker, whenever you have these breakthroughs, that's going to be super impactful. It's just going to have high impact for the poker community at large. At least that's my, that's my thoughts anyway. Sure. It's, it's a solid point. Like, uh, as I said, when I get that book, I have never knew how to think about range. Even as you said, you do that intuitively because you think, yeah, he could have that. He could be bluffing. Maybe he could have a skin here and so on, but you don't do that to the full, <laughs> to the fullest because you simply can't put the math behind it. And when you start doing that, things change for sure. Exactly. What's something the listener would be surprised to learn that you're horrible at? In poker? In life. (laughs) Oh, many things. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Well, I'm trying to get up every day at the same time. I'm horrible at doing that to the point that now I'm leaving my alarm clock in next room so that I would have to wake up and and get it. (laughs) So you, you can't wake up at the same time. I do wake up, but I can't get up from bed. So yeah, it's like fighting battle for me. I, I don't know why I'm fighting it, but I'm fighting it. I've actually found in my life kind of through, it's kind of random, but if I, the conventional advice is to wake up and get out of bed first thing, right? This is what I've always read that works for other people, but it has never really worked for me. What works for me actually is waking up and staying in bed for like an hour and letting oh, my really? letting myself wake up just and then I start my day. I, I get out of bed, I walk, I, I get my coffee, I stretch, I meditate, I do all the things after I've just laid there for like an hour in bed and I feel so much better. My energy levels are so much higher. I feel like I have so much more clarity. If I get out of bed and like first thing, drink coffee and try to go about my day. I feel like shit all day long. And I don't know how I figured that out, but one day it just happened. And I was like, I feel so much better. I wonder why. And then I started trying to piece it together and I just learned that about myself. Yeah, that's amazing because there's probably not many things in life that fits to everyone. So you kind of need to find what works for you. And in this like... While talking about getting up, I really loved Elliot Rowe's advice uh, he gave on the interview. He said, like, even if you are not able to, let's say, wake up one day, you should not be hard on yourself and just do it the next day. And when you're not blaming yourself for doing that, it becomes easier and easier. And this actually helped me a lot in, in many areas. So, yeah, while I do think you should be finding what works for you, but you also should not be getting hard on yourself when it doesn't work, but it's just meant to happen. We are not machines and everyone fail at everything at one point. And that's also an important realization, like not, yeah. not to not to want to become that machine. Pra- practice self-forgiveness. And when it comes to goal setting specifically, this is something that I see people mess up in goal setting. They don't have a range. So they don't have a bottom end for their goal. They only have this specific goal. And if they fall short, then they feel bad about themselves. But instead of just having a set thing, a set target, have a bottom end and a top end of your range. So some some days when you're not feeling it, maybe you hit the bottom end and you feel that sense of accomplishment that you got it done. But then some days when you're firing on, on all cylinders, you go above and beyond and hit the top end and then you f- can feel good about that too. But basically, you know, set yourself up to where there's a spectrum of success and it's not just binary to success or failure. And you can, you know, feel bad about yourself on days that you're, you know, you're not just, you just don't have it, right? Like this happens yeah. to everybody. Of course, of course. And that's the realization that it, it's not only you, man. Like, <laughs> Yeah, it's, uh, 
it's easy to be hard on yourself for not always being at peak cognition and peak performance, but that's just life and nobody's perfect. Yeah, and accepting that these things will happen just like in poker and life itself, it also make your life much easier. It will make, give you less stress, less anxiety if you have it. And generally, you will just be happier and it is proven that then you can perform much better than trying to do that from the other end. Elsa had it right in Frozen. Just let it go. Just let it go. <laughs> um, if you could erect a billboard that every poker player has got to drive past on the way to the casino, what does it say? Man, you have so many tough questions. <laughs> mm. Right now, I would probably put happiness brings success. What does that mean I, to you? Like... It means a lot because we all live in the world where actually is is a stigma that the harder you work, the more happy you will become. Where actually at this point of time, it is proven that the more happy you are, the better you will perform and the more success you will reach, which basically no one talks about that. And I highly believe in it because I see it in myself. When I feel better, I perform better. Not when I perform better. It doesn't make me feel better most of the time. <laughs> what does happiness mean to you then? Like what is, if you could break it down? Well, that's, it's not easy to break it down, but I mean, the closest to the thing is fulfillment, that you, are, you feel fulfilled with what you're doing. You have the purpose and you're pursuing your goals. It's not a... What I think it's not a fixed thing that you can reach and then have it. I don't believe in it, but it's a process it's rather than a process. Yeah. It's again, some days you're happier than others. It's a spectrum. Some of days course, you feel, like feel better normal. than others. Yeah. yeah. It's just a normal, normal aspect of being human. You can't be happy all the time. And that, you know, again, yeah, and having most- forgiveness for, for the days that you're unhappy, right? It's just, yeah, that's what I wanted to say. <laughs> yeah. Do you have any, you know, what's, what's your big goal right now as related to poker? Well, my goal is mainly related to my site, my poker coaching. And my goal is to reach monthly 100K visitors to the site. Where are we at? Halfway. Halfway? Yeah. So a lot. Well, to what you compare, but I'm happy. I'm happy. Like uh, this COVID situation helped me. <laughs> Yeah, like I definitely saw increase in traffic and in interest and in everything. So at least like always with all tragedies in life, there is some positive that you can take from it. Yeah. Like you said, uh, by the way, going back to it's all in how you compare, you can compare yourself to anything, right? Like if you compare yourself to Google, it doesn't matter who you are, you suck, right? Like if you compare yourself to Google, it's like in poker. If you compare yourself to Phil Ivey, you're going to suck no matter who you are. Um, right. And this is just the reality. And so a better goal in my mind is just try to be the best version of you you can be. Try to maximize your potential as a human being. Don't try to compare yourself to the best people in the field, the outliers, just the, the phenoms. Um, just try to be the best version of yourself you can be. And really, if you do that on a daily basis in the poker world, you find success at the end of the day if you dedicate yourself to that. Yeah, I guess it's twofold. I also believe that you should be comparing yourself to, to yourself back a few days. Yep. Are you getting better? Are you improving? But actually shooting for these like outliers, as you said, also gives you some boost. If it gives you some boost, if you want to do better, if you want to learn more, then it's okay. But if you just be hard on yourself because you're not Google, then it's probably not going in very well. Right. It's, uh, and, and two, you need to pick your targets well, right? Like if you want to be Fedor Holtz and you compare yourself to Fedor and you're a tournament player, it's probably going to be tough sledding. <laughs> no matter what you do, it's going to be really, really hard to get there. What's a project? you're working on within my poker coaching that is near and dear to your heart the project right now i'm working on launching a 14 days challenge so that goes it goes a lot of time and effort into that and i think it's going to be very beneficial for new players to learn the basics so basically going to cover 
a topic per day, like as we discussed, starting from what is actually important, not from the other way around. And I just want to create this guide that people just could just come at, and this thing alone could lead them step by step to actually playing like micro stakes. Of course, it's not going to be um, that you're going to crush mid stake games or, or higher tournaments after getting a free a free course. But but yeah, getting the basics and starting people to realize that poker is actually not not a gambling is what I'm trying to achieve. Where can they sign up for that 14 day challenge? Oh, it's not live yet. I, I'm just working on that, but it's going to be on my site. Definitely going to see wherever you visit it. How can they get notifications for it? And like, can they oh, hop okay. on your that, email that's list? That's a better question. Yeah. Yeah. I do have an email list. I do have a lead magnet as a book, as a book and a quiz test, which actually is very popular right now. So, and I think it's one way to, to boost your career as well. Basically you can take a quiz test and then, um, Based on the results, I give you the articles, what you should read based on your level, on your preference of game and so on, and some suggestions how to improve. Because uh, I feel like giving these random tips for everyone in the population is ridiculous. So I try to segment that. And if you sign up for, for that, for the quiz, for my email list, you definitely get notified when, when it's up. Targeted feedback based on the struggles that you're currently experiencing. It's pretty good. It's pretty good, sir. I'm very jealous. It's a very good system <laughs> for a lead magnet and people to get involved with mypokercoaching.com. Yeah, I'm trying to spread at, that someone at least would read my articles, man. <laughs> <laughs> this is the goal. This is like your evil plan behind everything is just yeah. <laughs> to make sure that people read these goddamn articles that you wrote. Um, and then I, I will create some kind of diversion. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, final question. It's been awesome having you on the show. This is a dumb question, by the way, based on everything we've talked about. But where can the Chasing Poker Greatness audience find you on the World Wide Web? Well, basically, my name is, is the same everywhere. So My Poker Coaching Twitter, My Poker Coaching Facebook. Uh, that's two main social media channels. I don't use anything else much. Obviously, I'm always happy to answer questions. You can shoot it direct me to my email at info at mypokercoaching.com. And please visit my site, check it out, see the articles, reviews. I'm pretty sure there is no player that would not find something beneficial there. That's awesome, man. Please read his articles. He wrote them with such love and care <laughs> and energy. Please just read his articles. <laughs> at least once. <laughs> <laughs> at least once. <laughs> All right, man. Let's uh, let's have a round two sometime in the near future. It's been awesome having you on. It's been great getting to know you. Best of luck at mypokercoaching.com. And uh, yeah, I'll catch you next time. Thanks a lot. It was a pleasure to chat. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Chasing Poker Greatness. If you have yet to subscribe to the show, please take a second to do so on Apple Podcasts or wherever your favorite place to listen to podcasts may be. For more content from me, Coach Brad, please visit our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash enhance your edge, and I'll see you next time.